a long introduction and um, happy to have Howard here. I just want to say that this is a conversation, so raise your hand if you have a question and, uh, and we'll, we'll have a dialogue. So thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so um, uh, let me start by saying I have nothing prepared. <laughs> And uh, that's a bit purposeful because I'm better when I'm spontaneous. But I also realize that um, I think you all have questions or curiosities about you know, the photographs, perhaps myself and my involvement and stuff. So just feel free to, to throw it out. First, I have to thank Daniel and Sarah. Um, they're terrific. They're doing a great job. Uh, Sarah with the running of, of this museum. Uh, Daniel as curator, and uh, particularly uh, I was, uh, you know, involved, as he said, a bit with the process of, of putting this uh, exhibition together and what will be the next one. And um, it's truly fulfilling for, for me to have these photographs uh, seen, to have them used, to have the students uh, work with them and learn from them and be stimulated by them. Uh, because that's the bottom line essential uh, hope that I had all these years as I donated all these photographs. Uh, it's a university. Uh, it's small enough that they're not lost, and this is proof of the pudding. And um, for me, that's much more meaningful than you know, having them in a, in a maybe larger, more prestigious museum where they probably hardly ever get you know, looked at or touched. So um, this is a culmination of all that, and I want to thank you guys for you know making it happen. Um, so I guess I have to say that I'm a very lucky guy. <laughs> you know, I, I did start out as a lowly photographer <laughs> uh, in Woodstock without much except a driving uh, passion and love for photography, and that kind of morphed into the history of photography, which was essentially due to my uh, education in the history of Woodstock as an art colony. Uh, it really turned me on. Uh, I knew nothing about it from college or anything like that. But um, uh, one led to the next, and, and I sort of dove headfirst into the history of photography. Uh, there was a lot of it all around me in Woodstock in, in the 70s. Even Watson Schutze, who had been in the photo secession, Alfred Stieglitz's group, lived there, summered there. Uh, Russell Lee uh, lived there. He was one of the FSA photographers, and many others. Uh, including uh, a man named Cy Cattleson, who I just visited this morning. Cy educated me about the Photo League. I didn't know about it. Cy's here. I think he's here. He's 93 years old. And all this came of Woodstock. Um, so I have a you know, great debt of gratitude to what happened to me in, in that place and uh, allowed for you know, what happened during all these years. Uh, so uh, I, I guess. You might say that I'm a totally obsessive lunatic collector, accumulator of, of things. Uh, I was one of these persons who, as a kid, you know, collected baseball cards and comic books and coins and whatever I can get my hands on. Uh, and uh, what I do now as an adult uh, is great because it allows me to be a kid, <laughs> and that is collect photographs. So uh, right from the very beginning, uh, I. I guess my timing was good because back then there was a lot of, a lot of stuff around uh, and wasn't worth very much and not too many people were really interested in it. So I was able to, to buy a lot or be given some cases a lot because um, uh, it was there and it was easy and no one was looking. <laughs> I remember going to auctions uh, not far from here and buying daguerreotypes. In the beginning, it was mostly 19th century and photographica that was uh, uh, interesting to me. And um, you know, you could get all that stuff in, in those days for very little. So it started me on, on this track of uh, collecting and accumulating uh, f photographs. Of course, as the gallery directed, I also began to represent a lot of photographers. And uh, one way or another, you know, literally thousands of photographers, thousands of photographs came into my life. Not always the best ones, can't possibly be that way, but, but lots of just great, great, wonderful photographs. And again, for, for myself, 
it was just an incredible education all these years. I didn't know about virtually any of these photographers, and I didn't, uh, I never saw the, the photographs themselves. There were no books on most of them. So um, as I went along, it was really wonderful to, to learn all this, and of course, equally wonderful these days to share it, because I think it's the greatest stuff in the world. You know, I, I, it's just so enriching my life, and I've noticed now that it does the same thing to a lot of other people. So sharing these photographs, um, doing some educating about them is, is just a great pleasure for me, and I think I'm blessed to be able to do all this stuff. So um, that's kind of a little bit of my history and how you know this all comes together with me. And um, I'm happy to field a question or two right now if anybody wants to. All right. Yeah, the, the photo right behind you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, photography is a form of documentation, and that the photo of the Keith Haring chalk this, drawing. This yeah, one. it's. Um, it's really a documentation because that mm -hmm. probably disappeared not too long after the photo was taken. And I've been there, there I'm sure you know there are these websites like Street Art Paparazzi mm -hmm. that, that document a lot of the street art, <clears throat> really, you know, these, these enormous murals that are painted on the sides of buildings. Mm -hmm. There are some down in uptown Kingston, mm -hmm. but all over. And there was even a book by one of these artists, Francisco Parajo, mm -hmm. called El Arte es Basura. He creates art out of garbage. And you know, after it's photographed and taken away, it's gone. You, know, it's, you can't that's, that's collect true. it. That's true. I mean, photography is a documentary medium uh, uh, in its essence. And it records uh, what's gone on. And a lot of times, what it record records disappears or has disappeared and it's not just street art it could be architecture it could be you know loads and loads of different things it's one of the great aspects of photography it still is let me say something about this photograph as long as you mention it so this is by Allen Ginsberg the poet and all other things that we know um, it's very atypical of his work um, he photographed uh, his friends sort of this environment around him uh, and often would actually write something, not a poem, but just a factual caption under the photograph about it. Usually, it includes someone we knew, or he knew, rather, and we know now, one of the beats or something like that. But um, it was, uh, see, this is dated 1987, and he started taking photographs as a young man, I think in the, even the late 40s. And uh, uh, what's interesting here is that around 1984, he started to show some of his photographs to some friends and they said hey you know th these are pretty good you might want to think more about your photography and a light bulb went off and suddenly he said oh I'm not bad you know I, sh I should do more of this so we started talking to Robert Frank uh, who we had known of course and, and Bernice Abbott he actually took a little class private class with Bernice Abbott and suddenly Alan became a serious photographer even though he had made loads of wonderful snapshots if you will up until that point but this comes more out of um, Allen Ginsberg being a photographic artist. <laughs> so it's not just documenting that, it's probably the way he included this in the frame that makes it such an interesting photograph. He probably would not have made that photograph four years before and before that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it might be interesting for you to hear uh, some of the stories about how these photographs came into my life. I find it, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, Ginsburg passed away and there was a auction of some of his work, not just photograph, all kinds of Allen Ginsberg things at Sotheby's and it included so, uh, just a couple of uh, small vintage snapshots. I call them snapshots, he used to develop them at the drugstore. And, um, uh, and I didn't know about it, so I took notice. And then, <clears throat> by the by, I, of course, I knew about the caption pictures because he had already had exhibitions and a couple of books and all this. So a friend of mine, oh, excuse me, I'm going to lose my voice because that's what happens when I talk loud. <clears throat> um, thank you. Just in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> A friend of mine um, 
knew Alan and knew the executives of his estate, and they had um, attempted to sell all the vintage snapshots to Berkeley and to Stanford. And they were given some kind of crazy global office. So uh, I was invited in to look at the work and maybe get involved with it. And um, it took me a few months to do it. It wasn't high on my list because I didn't think of Ginsburg so much as you know, one of the most important photographers in the world. But I went finally and looked. I spent two days looking and talking with them and really being turned on by, by what he did and what they had. And long story short, at the end of the two days, we all decided that I would just buy his entire photography archive, everything. <laughs> and um, it wasn't inexpensive, <clears throat> but they gave me great terms <laughs> so I could do it. And I wound up with, I don't know, 2,000 photographs by Alan Ginsberg. <laughs> and um, it's been great because we did exhibitions, we sent out exhibitions in Europe especially. Um, we helped the publication of a very good book. And then I was able to donate several pictures. And in the end, I sold most of the archive to the University of Toronto, where I didn't know in the beginning, but he had a great relationship. And, um, and they're u utilizing it in their study collection and everything. So it was a really nice process, the way the whole thing happened. Yeah. For me, the, the, the um, most obvious change in photography actually has a lot to do with going from film to digital. Um, when I was a photographer, what photography was generally about, or the art of photography, was going out in the world and finding the photograph, looking, using your intuitions, your timing, to make a good photograph. That's if you were doing sort of re what I call real world or street photography. Um, I think a lot of great photographers explored that method of making photographs from you know, early in the century on through the end. And um, with digital and with digital cameras, uh, and more importantly, perhaps, the fact that so much great photography has now come out, been published, been seen from the past, I think photographers have, uh, in general, serious photographic artists, have kind of moved more towards a conceptual notion, uh, an idea that they'll use the, the camera or photographic images to, uh, to bring out, to create bodies of work that are more about ideas than they are about the real world per se. You know, uh, that's one way you can look at the changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think this last year or two years ago, I went to an exhibit at the Jewish Museum mm -hmm. on street photographer. I Photography, but I think it was mainly around Jewish, mm -hmm. New York Jewish photographers. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's a subject that's very present in my life right now. Um, I don't know if you all heard, but um, uh, you're talking about a show that was at the Jewish Museum in New York two years ago. It was called The Radical Camera. And it was a show specifically about an organization called the Photo League, which I mentioned before. Mr. Cattleson over there taught me about the Photo League a long time ago. And um, that show at the Jewish Museum was actually a great triumph because it was the first time that the League as a whole uh, and what it accomplished was um, uh, in, a, in an important museum show that thousands of people saw and it traveled. And it, it, what I've noticed is it was the first time it really woke up the general public about that organization and what it did. And the Photo League was, uh, uh, it was officially, you might say, founded in 1936. It came out of a kind of radical left-wing um, uh, media group called the Film and Photo League that worked for the leftist press. And um, uh, it was, m once the Photo League saw it, there was much more of an interest in photography, more or less as an art form, than it was as just pure, um, uh, uh, propaganda form, okay? And uh, it so happened that the Photo League um, attracted a lot of young people, a lot of uh, immigrants, second generation often, people living on the Lower East Side. A lot of them happened to be Jewish. You know, that's, uh, I don't think it was by design. It certainly wasn't a religious organization, but, you know, friends of friends of friends, and it just grew that way. 
so that's why it was relevant to be in the Jewish Museum. But um, more importantly, uh, the Photo League is, is a great laboratory uh, for creating, uh, you know, real humanist documentary work and combining that with what um, the real art of photography was about. Uh, seeing, printing, very important. There's a photograph over there. Um, this vertical over there, the two people and the uh, kind of billboard behind it. So that's made by Sid Grossman. And Sid Grossman was uh, not just one of the founders of the Photo League, but he was the uh, person who ran the school for many, many years. And in certain ways, maybe the number one most influential uh, member of the League because he taught so many young photographers photography. And I'm sure so I will agree, as a lot of others that I've spoken to, he's a really tough task maker of a, of a teacher, but he created people who really knew how to make photographs. And um, I mentioned, Mr. President, I'm working on a large show right now of Sid Grossman for um, a photography festival in France this summer. And, and actually will probably be the first large show of his work since 1980, you know, which is crazy. So I hope that answers. <laughs> with my friend sitting on a stick. And it was just like that, that street photography, which you don't really, yeah. you know, now everything's the computer and it's different. altering color yeah. and stuff. It's very yeah. different. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions you've already answered about the transition from analog to digital. I think of your gallery, I think of black and white analog, mid mid 20th century work, or later, mm -hmm. Davidson, of that wonderful Gedney show that you have there now. How have you, both, I guess, both personally and, and professionally, how have you responded to the real revolution of digital photography? Slowly. <laughs> I mean that. You know, it, it's been uh, tough to uh, embrace it. I, you know, a lot of um, uh, gallerists, you know, in all media, and, and curators and critics, the, their appreciation for art and photography um, is more of an intellectual pursuit, if you will. Um, for me, it's not. <laughs> I mean, I'm interested in the information very much so, but it's got to, you know, for me to be passionate and care about it, it really has to affect me emotionally, you know? for my reasons. And um, when I first started looking at digital prints that were coming out, they were interesting and even sometimes beautiful, but I didn't get the same thing. <laughs> you know, I, 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 was, I used to work in the dark room. I knew about how hard it was to make a print and to get it just right, and digital didn't have that aspect to it. So I was having a hard time relating. Um, I can't say that at this point I've fallen in love with black and white digital printing. Now, I'm not talking about photography so much as the printmaking. Um, and in black and white, I, I've seen it's really getting good. Good to where it's starting to feel like the kind of uh, print that I, that I like. But I have really become a big fan of digital color photography. And um, I guess that started when I started representing a guy named Ed Bertinsky. I don't know if you've heard of Ed Bertinsky, but um, He's world class, and, and his work uh, has proven to me that, that the, what you can do w with digital photography, what, what happens to color in high uh, caliber digital photography and printing is unlike anything that was ever possible in um, you know, wet process color printing. And it's really quite extraordinary how beautiful and, and varied the colors can be, and also, also, you know, how sharp a picture can remain. So you can make a big print, and we, are, we used to poo-poo big prints because they look like posters. Now they work because they're exceptionally sharp and you have all the colors and the gradations, and um, I've learned to love it, you know. It's, it's, I'm really impressed with, with what the digital um, uh, technology has done for color photography, so. You know. <laughs> Yes. So I know that you were born in Brooklyn and that you went to the University of Buffalo. So what in 
interest you in moving to Woodstock and taking up the photography <laughs> there, photography, and the Hudson Valley in general? Uh, well, um, I had a couple of friends from Buffalo who started Candlestock in, in Woodstock, and I went to visit them. And, and I, I sat on the curb in the center of town, and a woman, scantily dressed young woman, went by on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to myself, I like this place. I think I'm going <laughs> to it's, it's a true story. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I, I, um, uh, after college, and I didn't go for art or photography, um, through a series of events, I, I got a camera, started making photographs. I was living back in, in Brooklyn. Um, and after a cross-country trip, I did come up to visit my friends from Buffalo who were living here. And uh, my she wasn't yet my first wife. We were married shortly after, but uh, she didn't really want to stay in the city and teach, and I didn't really want to go to psychology graduate school where I was supposed to be going. So we just moved up, and uh, I was lucky to get a job with the Woodstock Times uh, very quickly, within weeks after I moved up. Um, I made $15 a week, and I took all the photographs. I processed all the film for everyone and made the prints, and I couldn't have been happier. <laughs> I couldn't pay my rent, but I was really happy. <laughs> so that was, that was the transition. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you started the physical photography? So um, uh, during those years when I was a photographer for the Woodstock Times, I, I was real fortunate to meet a lot of people in Woodstock, a lot of the artists, a lot of, a lot of the people who had been there in, in the even 30s, but certainly 40s, 50s, 60s. And, um, and I, I came to realize that not too many people really knew about you know, photography, the, the art of photography, and, and how it was uh, booming in, in, uh, in universities and galleries were starting to open. It was really something going on. I was in love head over heels with it all, and I had I don't know why, but I sort of took on this mission that I wanted to show my community of Woodstock what photography was really about. Um, and that, that was the seed, you know, it was this, um, you know, this desire to, to, to d demonstrate. I guess that's why I opened the gallery afterwards, you know, I just, I really like to uh, share photography with, with the world. And um, that was the impetus behind the center, you know. over the years, and uh, that now photography is often embodied in uh, a body of work rather than an individual photograph. Uh, how do you feel about that when you evaluate uh, work? Do you look at the whole body of work? Do you evaluate the individual photograph? Uh, um, okay, yeah, generally I, I, well not generally, I always try and look at as much work as I can before coming to any you know, strong opinion one way or another. Because in photography, you can't, I mean, you could see one photograph, and it's a wonderful photograph, but it doesn't say anything as to, um, uh, it doesn't allow me to judge what I think about the photographer overall. Um, so yeah, I always, I mean, we all do that, though. We're always looking at a body of work, or several bodies of work, if you, if you will. And you get a sense when you look at a lot of photographs that one person made of, you know, of how good they are. Or I don't like to say good because that's a personal evaluation, but, but at least what they've accomplished, where, what their work is all about. Does it work, what they're doing? Is it moving me in some way or another? And, you know, <laughs> it's, there's, no, um, there's no formula for doing that. You just have to take it all in and, and see, see how it feels to you. Special favorite photographers that you, that you feel very strongly about? My daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, 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 I have a lot of favorite photographers. I really do. I mean, I, I, it's. I mean, the history of photography. Yeah, yeah which, I, I get asked. Do you think they changed how we look at things? 
Well, it's two different questions. You know, favorite photographers, um, I, there are many photographers whose work I look at and really gets me happy and excited. Um, photographers who have changed the course of photography or history, those sort of seminal. Again, there, there's a number that, that you can point out. Uh, even on these walls, there are some who fall in that category. You know? So there's no real one. I kind of embrace the whole of it. You know? Getting back to street photography and even like going into the digital world, when you look at these, and a lot of these like the photographers really like an observer. They're not, they're not really as very aggressive. Like in the 70s, 80s, I think street photography became a lot more. The photographer put himself into the scene, like people like Bruce Gilden and Mark Cohen, and people like William, William Klein. Mm -hmm. And you see, like with digital photography, not with the way the photos look, but how people use the medium of photography with the digital camera. Do you think they approach the street differently than, than they did? In well, it's, a, it's hard to say. I mean, di digital technology makes uh, the creative act of photography easier in many ways. You know, one thing for sure is you can take pictures pretty damn quick, and you don't have to worry about changing the film or going in the darkroom afterwards to process it carefully and the exposure and all that kind of stuff. So you're, you're so much freer to shoot, um, I, I think that that changes the whole aspect of it. You know, it's it's um, uh, unless you know exactly what you're trying to do, what you're looking for, the kinds of pictures you're trying to make. I think it dumbs down the process of, of street photography um, quite a bit. And you have to remember also with film. You're, you're always thinking about what you're going to do with it afterwards, so you've got to be careful about your exposure because traditional photography like this is really, uh, it's not just seeing, it's, it's also rendering. It's craft and it's vision and then it's craft. So um, you don't have to worry about that so much anymore. You can change anything to the way you want it after the fact. And I think that, that changes how people think about the photographs they're making. most important decision a photographer has to make, whether it from the days of film or digital, is still the same. What to aim your camera at, mm -hmm. whether it's film or whether it's digital. That's crucial. No, you have to see. I'm, there's no doubt that's the same. I mean, vision is vision. But what you're creating afterwards, I think, is what changes. And um, therefore, you need to have a good idea of what you're trying to create afterwards. It's too easy to go out and shoot, you know, and just, if you have an eye, you can make lots of good pictures. But that doesn't mean enough anymore. So what are they about? You know, where's, where's the, the, the you in those pictures to do something with it that's meaningful today? It was different. You know, 30, 40 years ago, when you went on the street, it was much harder to make a good final photograph, a good final rendering. There was so many more factors that you had to deal with you don't have to deal with so much anymore. And that's the big difference for me now. There are a lot of ideas that float for several years now about uh, the reality, the honesty, uh, the integrity of photography and photographs. Um, and uh, is that picture a real photograph? Uh, does it matter? Can you, all these kinds of things. Um, taking the objects and let's say, recontextualizing them, either tearing them up or placing them different or doing this and that, um, is, just seems to me like an exercise in using the prints as source for doing something else. <laughs> right? You know, and even if it's destroying them. So I, I don't, you know, as long as Robert doesn't mind, as long as you're not destroying a print that's worth $100,000, I'm sure it's okay, you know. <laughs> They were destroying um, pieces of newspaper. Mm -hmm. They were printed yeah. on newspaper. Okay. And then the show's being repeated in other venues. Right. Too. So it's like a party. You know, let's have a destruction party. <laughs> 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 yes. a question. Um, what is the first, do you remember what the first photograph you collected was? What was the first photograph I collected? Um, uh, well, 
I had friends who were photographers, and you know, we trade and all that. But I'd have to say the first photograph that was really meaningful to me that I collected was a photograph by Jerry Yulesman. Um, Jerry Yulesman was a photographer who would use several enlargers to make a final picture. And he was my hero for a time because when I first started photography, I was doing the same thing, but I didn't know about Jerry Yulesman. And then I discovered him and I took a long workshop with him in Millerton across the river. It was a place called Apiron, which used to have live-in workshops uh, in those days. And um, uh, Jerry was a great guy and, and um, uh, we got friendly and I, there was one particular picture by him. It was called Apocalypse. Apocalypse, right? And um, uh, I asked him, you know, how I can get a print. Actually, I'm sorry. I offered him a box of cigars because he was a cigar smoker. <laughs> and I wound up trading him two boxes of cigars for that photograph. And that was the, that was the first thing that I, you know, important photograph that I collected, yeah. Why also Why also Dutch masters. <laughs> I'm interested specifically in the Siskind photo, but in general, the, and this one was, uh, the, the original photo was taken in 48 and then not reprinted mm -hmm. until 1988. Right. So maybe in general you could talk about how how you, how you get access to photos that are printed later. Do you, do you help manage that process? Is that just things you just well, come upon? Or? If I'm not mistaken, oh, th this one is a play. Okay, because um, this is a portfolio that he did with um, a guy in Vermont, I'm forgetting. It was a Renaissance Press, and they did two or three portfolios. They did this platinum print portfolio, and they also did a portfolio of gravures, photogravures. Okay. And um, that's something that Siskin worked out he with did that the publisher. Great. Yeah, and I, I, I love that publisher's work. I did a, he also did a beautiful portfolio of Roy de Carava uh, gravures, one of my favorite things of all time. And um, anyway, so, so we did some trading and buying, and I wound up with that. Yeah. Thank you. I guess my question on Project is, there was a period of time in the 70s and 80s where even the New York Times was questioning photography as an art form, to some degree. And a lot of us here have lived through that. A lot of students maybe don't recognize the fact that, although photographers felt it was an art form, for the art world, there was a question of being presented. Now, the Center of Photography led the way. Your gallery was right on the cusp of this change mm -hmm. between photography being something that's okay, it's art, but it's over here, to where it's now completely embraced by the art community. Can you talk a little bit about that transformation and your own experience within it? Well, you know, I, I think we were all like a, a tidal wave, <laughs> you know, flowing over the art world. It, photography became so prevalent and prominent in so many ways. And more importantly, popular. You know, people can relate to photography pretty easily, in general. You know. um, not everybody can relate to conceptual art or abstract expression, whatever. You know, whatever other forms of art were going on then. And the museums really started showing a lot of photography. And the colleges all started photography programs if they didn't already have one. Um, so, you know, it's just it was this wellspring of photography that burst. And I think maybe the most important aspect uh, of its acceptance in the art world was when artists started using photography, you know, like a Cindy Sherman and uh, various other conceptual artists who were doing photography. So that's when photography and art, the lines of it, really started to cross. And you see, uh, photography in art galleries, not just in photography galleries. And that happened more or less in the 80s. It really came of age and um, changed the whole landscape for photography. Uh, this issue of permanence and impermanence, and raising more about an exhibit, um, with the final you know, file, whether it be a negative or a sepulchrome or, um, you know, Whatever, code slide. To now, digital files. Um, as a dealer, how do you respond to current work, which is made by something that's considered almost impermanent? Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't. I don't deal in in the digital files or the negatives. 
no, no, I just no. deal with the objects. <laughs> You know, um, and uh, of course, you know, the, the artist has to be concerned with that. Um, you know, my concern is to assist them in their uh, quest to figure out how to keep it, you know, make it archival, whatever they have to do. Sometimes we do that in the gallery. We're sort of source and resource for the artist. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's it, I think, preserving negatives is a little trickier right now than preserving digital files. With digital, I assume if you back it up and back it up well, even if the file gets corrupted in some way over time, you can reload. <laughs> um, if you destroy a negative or you know the mouse comes and eats it while it's in the basement, you have a bigger problem. You know, so I had that happen to my own photographs. I lost almost half of my negatives in, in a uh, uh, it wasn't a flood, it was a drip in its storage, and they all got wet and they sat there for a few years and the emulsion started running off the negatives. So I'm very sensitive about that. <laughs> yeah. So. Distinguish between photojournalism and, and this kind of, I mean, we're in a building that's called the Fine Arts, the fine, art, fine and Performing Arts Building. I hate that term, Fine Arts, but mm -hmm. that's what it's called. I'm working with a friend of mine who was the photo editor at Soho Weekly News, and he's got tons of photos, a lot of them are either celebrities or parties at the Mud Club mm -hmm. or musicians playing, but some of them are just street photos, mm -hmm. people, groups of people playing the congas in Central Park, which was controversial at the time because there were people who wanted to stop that. Now they're kind of, those are kind of historical documents, mm -hmm because of the way that people were dressed, you know, the hairstyle, the size of their afros, everything about them is historical. But they're also, I think, they're, they're terrific photographs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got one Ouija photo in here, mm -hmm. so you must yeah, accept you that. Yeah, you know, there's always this issue of um, uh, why is a photograph, or is a photograph art? Can it be art? Why is it art? I think that's what you're talking about. Um, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> But I, but I can tell you that in some cases, photographs are made for very utilitarian reasons. Sure. You're, you're a journalist, and you have to bring a photograph to you know, document that event that was going on. If you're worth anything, you try and make a good photograph. You get an interesting angle and all that. Um, and that's fine. Uh, if you're uh, working for a magazine, and you're illustrating Chanel's new hat, you know, you have to take a fashion photograph. And, and so on. But I think the line gets tipped in, in various ways. Uh, certainly one is um, uh, when photographs are made for purely personal reasons and the photographer uh, is a creative being and sets out to do what they do with the medium of photography. And uh, if they do it successfully and they have bodies of work that are very successful and they show something and say something that's you know, wonderful, well, it goes into a museum, you call it art. <laughs> um, and if it falls short of that, maybe not so. Uh, that's very simplistic, but it's kind of like that. I don't think photography, uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, I always thought of it, it's just another medium. It's no different than painting, drawing. It's got its own set of rules for sure, but it's just another medium. It's what, what the artist does with it that makes it, you know, worthy of being called art. And I don't think it matters if it's straight photography or conceptual or darkroom experimental or anything. It just has to, has to be good enough to transcend you know, what it is and, and, and become, you know. I find, for me, all this stuff is very emotional. If I have emotional responses to pictures, not just photography, to any picture, then it works for me as art. I might want to put it on my wall and look at it. Okay. You might not think it's art and all that, you know, fine. But that's my requirement for art. So, uh, so. You got an emotional response to a photo of Debbie Harry or Marilyn mm -hmm. Monroe, mm -hmm. Bert Stern, some of those photos mm -hmm. that he took. I mean, I yeah. consider them art. But is it because, you know, the subject is so fascinating or is it the quality of the photography that makes it um. art? It's a Good question. It's usually, yeah, some kind of, I mean, you know, an Avedon photograph of Debbie Harry, although I don't know if he took it, people would probably call that art, 
is probably pretty good. It's also his way of doing things, and he's acknowledged for very good reason of being an artist. You know, so there's that also. I think one thing that distinguishes photography from another art form like painting is that it carries with it all of these social dimensions. Like the fact that it's, a, going back to what you were saying about it having a hard time struggling to become recognized as an art form because it has associations with journalism, associations with portraiture mm -hmm. that more so than any other kind of art form, it always kind of carries these social dimensions into the artwork. And now you see it with photographers that are working with issues of surveillance, or just the simple fact that everybody now has a camera, adds another social dimension to an art photographer taking pictures. And I think you see that so much in the work here on the walls, is that social dimension of it that's as present as the mm -hmm. is. Although, in the history of photography, there's lots of photography was made that had no social dimension. You know, there was a lot of uh, avant-gardism and abstract work being done in the 20s and 30s, uh, just because it was new and, and uh, exciting for artists to play with, making photographs in the darkroom, primarily. Um, so it's not only, but, but by nature, though, again, photography is a documentary medium. You know, you, you record what's going on there. And then the photographer or the artist interprets it. They do it the way they do it. And that's what changes it from just a straightforward uh, utilitarian function. Um, yeah, I like humanist photography. A lot of this reflects even, even the pictures that are not necessarily with people in it. You could call humanist. Uh, uh, that's an abstraction of architecture. A person made that. <laughs> you know, it's real world. Uh, and so on and so forth. Although most of these pe pictures do have people in them, for me, it's most interesting. That's what I've shown in my gallery over the years. <clears throat> I like humanist uh, art. You know, I like um, art, as I say, that's emotional, and that often includes people one way or another. But someone else, another gallery, uh, whatever, might do it entirely differently, might have other ideas. Photography does loan well, though, <laughs> to the human condition and to talking about what we're about and what our world around us is about. I think it's uniquely f suited for that. You talked about the photo lady. Uh, I was wondering, what are you excited about now? Do you continue to mine in the 20th century? Or are you mm -hmm. contemporaries coming in? And well, what's your passion? I, I, I'm trying to get more, um, how should I say, cozy with contemporary work in general. It's not easy. <laughs> it, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of contemporary work I see, I, I don't really like very much. Um, not because it's bad necessarily, it's just, you know, I'm not, I'm sort of stuck <laughs> in my period and it's very hard, but I'm trying. So um, uh, we have taken on some contemporary photographers, they tend to be over 50, but they're, you know, mid-career, you might say. Uh, and they're doing very different kinds of work than what you see on the walls here. Uh, my parameters are the same. If I have a real emotional response, if it does something to me. And I love the medium of photography. So sometimes it could be the print itself, something going on with how their photographs are, are rendered, are put down. Uh, that can get me excited. It might not have anything to do with the content or the subject. It could be the photographic aspect of it um, that gets me going. We, we just had a show of a, a Korean woman named Jun Jin Lee. I don't, you see it? <laughs> he liked it. It's like that. <clears throat> Her photographs are, <clears throat> excuse me, ma masses of, of gray, you might say. <laughs> they're, they're really flat, uh, very minimal, abstract, even the landscapes. There's something about them that's very dreamlike and, and otherworldly, if you will. <clears throat> In her case, it comes from her use of the medium. How she, she goes out and she takes a straight photograph, but then her style of, of, of printing it and, and putting it down on paper finally changes it entirely to, to this sort of magical kind of photograph. It's her own thing, you know, so that gets to me. I love it, you know, and she's a contemporary worker. So, you know, I, I try to find those 
uh, kinds of photographers and doing some, something that, that gets under my skin that way. Um, but in terms, I just also, uh, uh, Saturday afternoon on my way up here, I, I stopped off at an old friend actually from Woodstock who's been in the uh, uh, private dealer of usually um, uh, ancient art and photography over the years. And he was showing me about 10 very abstract 20s, 30s, experimental kinds of photographs. Uh, he's ready to, to sell it. And, and I was in heaven <laughs> looking at that stuff. And I might buy the whole group from him. So, you know, it could be either. I, I'm still very much turned on by the things that always got me going, which is, you know, great classic photography. Awesome. Maybe we could just have one or two more questions okay. and then give Howard's voice a rest. So, so generous. I don't mind. <laughs> yeah. so I think there's a woman over here who's been waiting to answer questions. Do you ever forget what you have? <laughs> Do you ever forget what you have? What? Do I have a count? Do you ever forget, forget. forget what you have? Forget? Yeah. I can't even remember my name. Come on. <laughs> yeah. There was a time when I remembered every single picture that, that I hadn't went through me, and I do not remember anymore. It's really embarrassing when somebody comes over to me and says, I bought this great photograph from you 20 years ago. It changed my life. It was so wonderful. And I look at them and say, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> then it's scary, right? <laughs> do you still have the Jerry Wilson photograph? Well, I'm not a very good custodian. custodian. <laughs> I've become much better in recent years, but I had it um, stored in a, in a portfolio case along with a bunch of other things in one of my houses back then in Woodstock, and it kind of got ruined. But I replaced it. <laughs> I got another print of it, yeah. Okay, one more question. On your pedigree for photography and art itself, how do you feel about image editing programs like Photoshop and recent techniques? Do you think that they might take the uniqueness out of a photographer's work? And because I know that a lot of my photography professors, they're always teaching us new lessons, and it seems like you're doing more things to please them in, in your work and doesn't always feel as your own work. <laughs> the way I see it, it's, it's another medium. Photoshop, it's a medium, you know, it's, it's just something we use to, you know, we put something into it, we come out on the other side with something else. So it really depends on what you do with that you know, um, as to whether it's good or important or whatever. You know, it's, it's not, it's, technology itself only gives us tools to create with. You know? And um, at any given moment in our history, those tools are slightly different and what's created is slightly different. It's got to measure up to its standards of the time, and it's out there. You know. Do you think that changes? Basically, hmm? with film work, do you think that has anything? You know, it's not as I don't know. It's not as organic as film photography. Do you think it's different in some way, and that it's changing? Well, again, the, the craftsmanship aspect is entirely different. I mean, you have to make choices in Photoshop. You know, and, and the choices are actually quite infinite, but um, it's, a di it's a different, you know, what, what, what you can do and how you do it is just a different activity than going in a dark room and making a print, which has a lot of its own set of choices and difficulties, but there is something in, in the materials and the, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, primitive side of it, if you will that makes it a little more difficult and sometimes a little more interesting. And also, each time you do it, it's different. It comes out differently. So you have to make decisions as to which, which variation is the right one. Photoshop and digital technology is not quite like that. You know, you don't come to it the same way. Again, I don't think one's better than the other. I really don't. Um. So anyway, this has been an amazing Thank you. Thank you. I didn't. I, I, I didn't talk much about the photographs, but. But, but uh, I do want to mention that's a good segue to what I was going to okay. say about the fact that there is an exhibition catalog that exists, and there also contained in that catalog is an interview with Howard, okay. and more writing about these particular photographs yeah. that are here as well. As, 
So I Can, encourage you one, to- One more thing. I, I, did, I didn't mention a real shout out to the students. You know, all, all the captions are based on research that the students here did on the photographs. It's their show. Great. Thank you. So thank you all for coming and have uh, continued to look around the galleries and have a great afternoon.